Roll, pal, welcome. It's great to be here, Greg. Good to see you. Good on you. Roll, tell us a little bit about yourself and where are you? And um, also, um, tell us a little about um, what you're doing right now. Yeah, so I'm an Englishman living in the middle of a small island in the Caribbean, a salty rock in the middle of nowhere. I got here by, I was 10 years working for some of the biggest investment banks in the world, in the UK, in London. Um, I ended up at Goldman Sachs, where I ran their hedge fund sales business, started it and ran the hedge fund sales business and equities and equity derivatives. I then ran a global hedge fund, a macro hedge fund, investing in all asset classes across the world, and then opted out of the rat race, moved to the Mediterranean coast of Spain in 2004, and started writing macroeconomic research and investment strategy for the world's biggest hedge funds, family offices, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds. And in that journey, I was there in 2008 when the financial crisis came and I saw it coming and I wrote about it and we actually all profited from it. And that felt wrong because people come to me and say, well, why don't we know about it? And I thought, yeah, this is not right. Then the European crisis came along 2012 where we almost lost all of the European banks and the Euro itself. Same thing happened. I kind of forecasted it was gonna happen, what was going on. And friends of friends, friends of my parents come up to me and said, you know, why didn't anybody tell us? Because people lost their life savings in both of these things. And at that point, I realized I wanted to do something about it and cut forward a couple of years. And I started um, a media business called Real Vision. And my job as CEO and co-founder of that is to democratize the world's very best financial information, to give those people, to give the average person access to the, exactly the same information that the world's most successful and elite hedge fund managers and money managers have. So that that's really what I'm doing now. I run that. I still run my research service. And I'm also deep down the rabbit hole of crypto. And um, just on, on that, not your education programs and, and everything, maybe can you tell everybody how can they, you know, get some information? How, how can they register on your database? Yeah. Easiest thing is, look, if you're interested in crypto, it's free. And I purposely created it because I think it's one of the biggest and most important trends in the entire world that we will ever have. So real, realvisioncrypto.com. Uh, just sign up with your email address. And there is a wealth of information that you'll ever need. Interviews with the most famous people in the space, the thinkers, the dreamers, the money managers, everybody. Also, mm -hmm. realvision.com gives you the same access, but to the world's hedge fund managers and elite investors across all asset classes. We've got thousands of people from Australia, New Zealand, all as members. So we've got a very global audience. Yes, I've just, um, you know, I've just been going through the series. I, I signed up and uh, uh, some months ago and I signed up and I really enjoying the series on the psychology of why people do things and they invest and what the emotions they go through. You, you thought of everything. I like it. Yeah, we tried to cover it because, you know, investing is not, somebody giving you a trade idea that's actually the least useful thing what's really interesting is teaching you how to fish how to find the idea what makes a good idea what the psychology is when you put the idea on are you panicking into the trade are you going to panic out what's your time horizon just teaching people all of those things as well as giving them the pure information of what's going on in china what's going on with the aussie mining industry you know what's going on with oil right now what's going on in crypto so it's all of these things Look, I remember um, I've been in financial services for 35 years and um, I remember many, many years ago, 30 years ago, I was um, showing um, some people some properties as part of their portfolio. They were going to buy some properties off the plan. At any rate, uh, there were apartments and they were in the suburbs of Sydney and this husband and wife who I, I did all their financial services, their insurance, their life insurance and so forth. And um, they bought off the plan this particular product in uh, the suburbs of Sydney. And as it was being built, you know, the word was on the street that the valuations were going up, you know, amazing people were going to make great money at the end of the project, which is about 12 months later. I get a phone call out of the blue from the client and he says, can you come and see us? So we need to speak to you uh, about something. So I go to their, go to their home and I'm sitting there and, and uh, at any rate, he said, look, we need to pull out of this um, development. I said, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand. The, the valuations are already in. Uh, they're, 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 when, they're, when that's finished, you're going to make money. Don't, don't, don't worry. And he said, no, you, you don't understand. My wife 
cannot cope. And she cries herself to sleep thinking about going into a debt on an investment property. And at that young age, I realise we all have different emotions and what doesn't affect me does affect other people. And, and I got a real, real lesson at the age of 27 that I just didn't know people. And this is why I was interested in that, you know, your psychology of why people buy and what they can cope with, what they can't, why they make bad decisions. I mean, it's a big subject. It's a big and we subject. realise this. We, we, we asked our audience kind of who they were because it, you can look at the demographic numbers and they're 38 years old on average and, you know, they, they're well-educated and they're wealthy and all of this stuff. But I wanted to find out who they were and I found that they were people who wanted to learn. So I dug in, why, why do you want to learn? And it comes out of fear, the strongest emotion. And it's the fear of messing up your finances. And we realize that what Real Vision actually sells is confidence. It gives you confidence to make investments that you feel you're in control of your own money. Very good. And that's why I'm telling everybody out there, go and register <laughs> with this man's site. Do it. And I, I did it. I instantly became addicted to some of, some of your, your little portals and your little, some of the little podcasts and some of whatever. And, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So thank you for that. Now, Roel, you got involved in cryptocurrency. You used to be, you, you're in the traditional investing side of the world. You, you were, by the age of 35, you were a bit of a genius as a young hedge, hedge trader. You were kicking big goals. I know that. I've done my research. When and why did you get involved in cryptocurrency? So remember the story of 2008 and 2012. It's all part of that story. It actually starts when I'm at Goldman Sachs, the Asian crisis happened in 97, 98. That was a crisis of debt where all of these Asian economies had borrowed too much money and blew up. George Soros wrote a book about it called The Crisis of Global Capitalism. And he said, listen, this debt bubble is likely to transfer itself to the developed world and he was right and that there would be a crisis that got me attuned to it and i realized that the world was massively in debt never been this far in debt 2000 um, boom bust comes along the debt crisis didn't blow up because they started cutting interest rates then we go to 2008 and we've transferred the bubble from equities now into property and that brings down the world's financial system and the central banks discover a new trick which is we're going to print money. But also over 2008, we discovered some other things like nobody knows who owns what in this very leveraged financial system. You know, somebody in Lehman Brothers, nobody knew who owned all of these bonds and stuff. So I realized there was a problem with ownership. There was a problem with leverage and the system was still not fixed. And then the debt bubble blew further. And I knew that the, by the time we got to the European bubble, it was now affecting major developed governments, Spain, Italy, France. And I thought, we need to find a way out because the governments are going to keep putting sticking plasters on it, printing money, debasing currency, and finding a way of not letting this deflate. And we know that the more you blow up a balloon, the more likely it is to implode. So I thought, I need to do something about this. So I started researching building the world's safest bank, which is a slightly hubristic thing to do but I thought I'd give it a go and I went around the world trying to set up this bank and it's hard and I gave up and a friend of mine tapped me on the shoulder and said you looked at bitcoin this was 2012 he said I think it's the answer you're looking for so I looked at it saw it very quickly blockchain allows people to store all of these assets and know who owns it that solves most of the financial systems problem it's also better way faster way of settling and everything else and bitcoin itself had this kind of limited supply that maybe it could be a store of value. So I wrote the first paper on it that was a macro paper saying, listen, if you compare it to gold, with gold at $1,300, Bitcoin should be worth about a million. And I published that and kind of a lot of people went, wow, we've never seen a macro research piece because at the time it was like a geeky tech thing. Um, I then bought it myself back in 2013 and it went up 100% in a month. And I sold it. I'm like, financial markets don't do this. Options might occasionally, but something's weird about this. It, it's a bubble. Or I don't understand it. So then I left it again and I rebought it. And then I held it all the way 
2017, it went from $200 to $2,000. I sold it. I thought it was a hero. It went to $20,000. Three months later, I felt like an idiot. Um, but I was out, but I was very interested in the space and then watched the whole development of the space grow. And I knew that the next recession, this force of debt and central banks and all of these open questions were going to get exposed all over again. So I became quite well known in March 2020 saying, OK, this is the time to go all in on crypto, because the only answer here is for the banks and governments to spend massive amounts of money. And it was likely to drive the value of crypto up and people would understand the value of blockchain and what this could mean in terms of crypto assets. And um, and so. I've got heavily involved then and have had 100% of my net worth, of my liquid net worth in this space ever since. Oh, Raul, if only <laughs> you'd kept all of your coins, my friend. I know. But I've got, I, a, mean, I must admit, I've got a bigger position now than I had then. So in the end, we got there in the end, but I went the painful route. I should have just oh, kept hold of it. Being quiet would have been fine. Oh, Raul, I wouldn't be telling anybody what you're telling me. <laughs> As the truth about financial markets is, my friend, we all make mistakes. <laughs> oh, God, I love it. Uh, listen, the Amer American regulators have just given the green light for ETFs. Now, what's this? This is institutional money. This is money from all over the world. This is, this is open slather. What's the impact? What's going to happen? <clears throat> well, it's the fourth biggest ETF by inflow on day one in history. It's basically allowed the registered investment advisors who control the average person's savings access. It's allowed pension funds and hedge funds access without having to get special clearance. So it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. Now, it's not a perfect product because this one's based on a futures contract. So it can deviate from the price of Bitcoin. It's not great. But in terms of democratizing this great technology and the investment opportunity, it's huge. Because now anybody can buy it in their Robin Hood app on their phone in seconds without having to open a whole other set of accounts and figure out how you're going to store it and all the other stuff we all have to figure out. So it's big. Yep, it's big, all right. There's no doubt about that. Um, but China's decided they want to ban the stuff. Is this going to help or harm? China's gone through this ban phase a few times. You've got to remember that China is trying to solve other issues. One of them is they have a closed capital account, which means you can't take your money out of China because the Chinese actually don't have that much reserves versus the size of their economy. And if it leaves, they don't want their currency to come under pressure. And there's a lot of money in China. And they saw that the crypto markets were being used to get money out. So they just want to stop that. They, it's a control economy. They want to control the elements of what they want to allow and what they don't want to allow. They also have a leverage problem in China. There's so much speculation and leverage, particularly in the property market, that they've been clamping down on that in years. So first it was the shadow lending markets. Then it was the bank lending. Then it's the property markets. We've just seen that with Evergrande. And it's also crypto because that's another way of accessing lending markets privately. So I don't think they're thinking crypto bad. They're thinking, we don't want our people to use crypto in these ways. So we need to stop that for now. I think it will be back, but they just need to figure out how to regulate it better. Yes, well, but there lies the secret of cryptocurrency. It's not regulated. It has freedom. It doesn't sit well with China. And, no, it does not. Uh, it does it's, not. It's never going to sit well with China. So um, they have their issues there because that's the secret. That's the secret of a success. That's the formula that just makes that extra thing. And yeah. if it's, it it's only makes up 90 and uh, 99.9% uh, of its secret. So um, China <laughs> have an issue there. And it's the interesting to see India went that approach, the other giant economy, went that approach and then backed off. The court oh. threw it out. The court threw it out. They tried to ban crypto. The court oh, threw okay. it out, said it's unconstitutional. Oh, so now yeah. India is wow. the third largest adoption of crypto of any country in the world. Well, I didn't know that. This is breaking news. So tell me, this is so India's back in the boat. Yep. 
And wow. it looks like when you're talking to, you know, people within India, they're going to allow much more innovation in the space because they, they created their own kind of digital payment system and currency system a while ago, about four years ago, five years ago. And they're going to, I think, allow the innovation because India's got a lot of innovators and a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of smart people. And when they tried to ban it, a lot of people stepped up and said, no, 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 this is the wrong thing to do. This is our advantage, our advantage over China, our way to make a bigger stake in the world. And look, Indians don't move fast. Um, being half Indian, I know this. Um, they don't move fast. They're quite bureaucratic. But them just doing nothing now will just allow these entrepreneurs to explode in innovation. So watch but that wasn't, space. Wasn't, wasn't India sort of holding the backbone of gold on their back for so long? I mean, they were driving. So they, so, exactly. So they get it, right? Indian investors understand it. And young Indian investors, because don't forget the average age of an Indian is like 26 years old. Well, they get digital world. So if their parents were gold investors, it's easy for them to think about Bitcoin as a, as a digital gold. No problem. Yeah. Because they, they live in will. digital worlds now, right? Yeah. Look, China may obviously try and come up with their own uh, cryptocurrency. I don't, don't know how well it will go. What are your thoughts? Will, will I come up with it? And will yeah, it so work? they've got their own. They've got their own, which is a central bank digital currency. So it's pegged to the yuan, their, their, their currency. And so it's not a crypto in the way that it operates independently. It's, you know, this is still government driven fiat currency. And they're going to roll that out. They're testing it out in regions already. And then they will mandate it across the world. But they're not the only ones. I mean, I just last week spoke to the chief fintech officer for the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Singapore's going that route fast. The Europeans are going that route fast. Um, the US is lagging, but will go that route. Russia is looking at that route. The Swedes are going that route. So we're going to live in a world of digital currencies very, very soon. So that you'll have the digital Aussie dollar um and there'll be no bank notes left and you know using your mobile phone you just be able to tap everything pay for everything and it's all done and you can pay taxes instantaneously and all of this stuff well you're th you're talking too quickly here i mean we can't swallow all that in one bite <laughs> well, there's a lot going on in this space yeah, it is. It is. It's interesting. The more the more I've done research in the last two weeks, because I was going to interview yourself and Robert Brelove and Scaramucci and others, and the, the more I look into it, the, you open one door, there's another 10 questions. I mean, it's just like, and then you open another door and there's another 10 questions and it just went on and on and on. So, I mean, and when you open that first door, you usually come in a bit cynical, but inquisitive. And then you walk into this new room and you go, wow, wow. Mm. And then you think, hey, I've got it. I understand it now. And then you go, well, what's that door over there? You open it and go, oh, my God, what's that? And before you know it, it's a maze because you'll discover it's the biggest thing you've ever seen. So to explain this to people, the Internet grew at 63% a year in terms of number of users from 1990 to 2000. In 1997, there were 150 million users of the internet. And as I said, it was growing at 63% a year, the fastest growth of any technology the world had ever seen. We all know that, we all talk about the internet. So here we are today in cryptocurrencies. They've also been around about 12 years, 10 years. Currently, there's 150 million users, but the network is growing at 113% a year. So it's twice the speed of growth of the fastest technology the world has ever seen. We've never seen anything like this. And what this is, is the network of money. And it's exploding in size. It's a $2 trillion asset class currently as of today. If we look at the other major asset classes around the world, equities, bonds, real estate, they're kind of range between 150 and 350 trillion US dollars. So this digital assets, if we just follow that adoption curve that we're looking at, they will get to a $200 trillion asset class, which is, we'll have never seen this happen by 2030. 
We'll have never seen an asset class that didn't exist come out of nowhere and be worth $200 trillion. So to think of it, what does it mean? Why should anybody care watching this? This is an entire asset class that's going up a hundred fold by the end of this decade. It's like the one of the easiest ways to make money and prosper is to have a, a wave behind you, the wind in your sails. This is the biggest wind in your sails you'll ever have. And so many people are being cynical fighting it. And if you just turn and don't face the wind, put it in your back, you can sprint. And that's the opportunity here. Well, we, we're going to stop breathing in a minute after what you just <laughs> said. That's just uh, crazy stuff. I mean, if it goes it, to that sort of numbers, we're talking Bitcoin will be worth millions of dollars of Bitcoin. Yeah. So if you think about it, Think of a comparison and think how stupid it sounds. If I said to you, oh, you know, Sydney Harbour real estate is going to go up 100, 100x. And I could pretty much show you how and why and it was going to happen by 2030. You just do everything you could to buy as much property as you possibly could or build it or start real estate agents, anything. When people tell you about cryptocurrency, people are like, well, I'm not sure about that. The government's going to ban it or you know, whatever it is, because people fear change. And this is a gigantic change, but it's really exciting. Yeah, it's very, very exciting. That's for sure. Um, listen, um, printing of money has been a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of a hobby for America and other parts of the world. They like it. It's, uh, they like the hobby and they just keep printing it and keep printing it. Now, I've been told by some of my good friends around the world who are as um, Nelly as smart as you, but not as. And they've told me that 80% um, uh, of this stuff finds its way to the share market, gold, uh, cryptocurrency, and whatever. They're going to print another three or four trillion dollars, I believe, in the next six months. It's all going to rush in. I reckon more will go to crypto. Uh, very little is going to gold. Uh, there's an, and there's another part of this too, which is. What you do when you create an excess amount of something, so let's say iron ore in Australia, if you pull too much out of the ground, demand collapses. I mean, you, you've got too much supply, so prices fall, right? Hmm. So if you create too much supply of a currency, and we see it because the banks are hoarding this stuff, the price of the currency falls. Now, we're in, we grew up in a world where the Aussie dollar goes up against the US dollar or goes down or, or the euro goes up against the Aussie, right? That's the relative valuation. But Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Europe, the UK, Canada, the US, they're all printing money. So what happens is the value of all of these currencies falls together. So you're like, well, how can that work? Surely one has to go against another. No, they fall against things of scarce supply. Gold. Bitcoin, real estate, equities. Those are why these things go up so much. It's the value of the denominator goes down, the fiat currency. So if you ever look at the chart of the Venezuelan stock market, it's the best performing stock market in the world and has been forever, but it's not. That is priced in Bolivar, but the currency keeps devaluing about 70% a year. When you put it into US dollars, the stock market's gone down a lot. This is what is going on. So the central banks around the world, the G4 big central banks, are printing currency at the rate of about 15% a year. So your hurdle on your investments is now 15% a year or you're getting poorer. I, you can afford less of a house or less investments every year because of this. And crypto is one of the only things that outperforms the central bank balance sheets. So I checked this and looked at real estate prices in Germany against the ECB balance sheet flatline. They're the same thing. Well, German real estate looks like it's going up. Swedish real estate, UK real estate, Australian real estate, Canadian real estate, US real estate, they're all the same. What they're doing is reflecting the fall in the value of the currencies created by the central banks creating too much currency. What you're saying here is that um, we're going down this 
track this journey in our lives for the next 10, 20, 30 years, it's almost like there's a big curtain up and we all, none of us know what's behind it because the world's just taken a different turn financially. And it's and the point being is I'm not sure that when you open the curtain, it's not the Wizard of Oz. The man behind the curtain, the guy doesn't actually know what's going on. <laughs> and I don't think they know how to control it either. We kind of are where we are. We've got the world's most indebted economies. What would, what would any of us do? What are you going to do, raise rates and destroy the economy? Let inflation run and destroy the debt? Or debase your currency? Well, you'll try and do all of, as much as you can of not letting it blow up. So you'll just keep printing money, buying assets, don't allow recessions. Whatever you do, don't let the collateral go bust. And as you just said, hey, listen, just put the wind on your back and just go with this baby. That, and, that's, and that's my view. And because it, it is risky, risky in the way that it's volatile. So I don't, it's not a risky investment. It's not going to go bust. It's volatile. But you get more than compensated for these big price swings by the price rises. Because there, are, you know, the cycle tends to see like a 70% downside and a 10x upside every few years. So you get more than compensated for the risk. But people aren't used to taking risk anymore because the central banks stop anything bad happening or anything else. But yes, if you've got the longer term time horizon, you just buy this stuff. And when it sells off, you buy more of it and just hold it as you would do with gold. Speaking of gold, it would appear it's treading water. No, it is treading water. <laughs> that, would, um, that, would be a, that, that would be a nice statement. I thank you. Yes, I, 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 I try to be like that. But... I have a feeling cryptocurrency is taking all the oxygen out of the room. Thought? So I advise an elderly Italian um, who is a very famous large family office in Italy. And he's the patron. He's 86 years old. And he loves gold. His crypto positions are now larger than his gold positions and risk adjusted they're like four times as big now you know he's a he's a cool guy and he he likes trading but if an 86 year old italian um who's you know a very famous guy has put most of his kind of liquid net worth in it you understand that it's robbing gold because yeah. he's a classic gold investor. He's a classic gold investor. Mm. 86 years of age. They're not buying green bananas at 86 years of age. <laughs> but he's still buying. <laughs> not buying green bananas. <laughs> Sorry, you didn't realise how funny I was, did you? No, but okay. that, was that was actually very funny. <laughs> um, look, you, you told... You told us how quickly these wallets, and you know, you you stole one of my questions here. Thank you very much for that. Um, you, you told me how these wallets are are, are growing. Um, you know, give us a rundown. Now, how many wallets are there? Uh, I don't. Uh, there's a there's 150 million users of. Oh, crypto. okay. Let's use it. Sorry, I used the wrong word. I take that yeah. back. So, 150 million users. 2000 uh, October 2021. Correct. Okay, so that does this mean in uh, 12 months from now, we might be 150 million users? So if you, so, extra so if you extrapolate the numbers, we will get to a billion users. A billion by users. By 2024. Well, that'll... We will get to 4 billion users by the end of the decade. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I made a wrong mistake there. Sorry, I read the wrong thing. But yeah, I'll, that's amazing. All right, I'm going to write that down. Okay, could we see governments around the world try to halt this crypto madness? I don't think they can, because it is decentralized. There's no company to sue. There's nobody to go after. 
So the only people you can go after is your own citizens for owning it. Yeah. If I'm right and we go up as far and as fast as I think we're going to go, I think that ship sailed. Mm. Probably sailed about two or three years ago where they could have done something about it. I think it's almost impossible now because of the speed of adoption, how many businesses, how much capital is in the space, they, they would even dare to do it. And don't forget, in the US alone, the largest part of the voting population is now the millennials. What are you going to do? Tell them they shouldn't have the upside? No, they love this stuff. They love yeah. it. And guess what? They're voters. There's no way they can stop this. Well, the central bank... They've lost power. They've lost bank fees. They've lost many things. This is a problem, Rob. This is a big problem. So what, so what do they want? And I've thought long and hard about this. What do central banks and governments actually want? Governments want one thing and one thing only. Their fair share of the tax take. Hmm. Hmm. We've got open economy, so I can send money to you as much as I want. You could send it to me. And as long as we pass AML and KYC, nobody cares, right? Because we've got open economies. So they're not worried about us moving money around. What they want is if I'm making money, I should get charged capital gains tax on it. If I'm making income or interest, I want to get paid income tax on it. And they don't want you to keep that out of the system. And that's fair enough, right? So that, I think, is the battle. The central banks don't want to lose control of the banking that they oversee because they think control is the right thing. They will put a set of controls around some of this, but they can't around all of it. So they'll try and restrict some, some uses for some people. But there is the a battle big, to have. Yeah. But, Raul, the, the big secret, the magic, the magic formula the magic sprinkle, the dust, is because it's not regulated. That's what's made it special. If it gets regulated, will they take the magic away? They can't regulate what it is. All they can regulate is how you use it. So I don't think it's easy in this digital world where we can operate freely in ways that we want to make it that easy to stop, let's say, us borrowing and lending or investing in crypto. And I don't think that that is their ambition. But there's this thing called DeFi, decentralized finance, that is rapidly going to disrupt the banking system. They're going to worry hell about that because they can't control it then. Why do the central banks need to control banks? Well, banks are risky and they blow up, so we need to control them, right? Well, they still blow up, even with these people controlling them. So that doesn't really help. But they also do that because banks are the way of using monetary policy. Central bank gives the cuts interest rates, the bank pass it on, that all works. So how does that work with this new decentralized world? Well, they don't know. The answer, that's why they're building these central bank digital currencies. Because then they can work in this world too, so if they want to give you a higher rate of interest than me, they can. Or if they want to give you a stimulus check and take tax from me, they can do anything they want with this new formula. So it changes how monetary policy works. And I don't think we'll just see this cutting of interest rates or printing of money as the way that, that the central banks operate. So I think everything's changing. I saw recently the numbers of people who uh, have invested in cryptocurrency and it was like something like 74% was millennials and about 4% was baby boomers and, uh, and whatever. Look, you know, you know, in, in the short time I've got to know you, you're a, you're, a, you're a thinker, you think through every question as I speak to you, you think very clearly what you're going to say. What would you say to, and I'm going to say to the baby boomers, what would you say to the baby boomers? Because my audience is very strong in baby boomers and they're only 4% in. What would you say to them about this? So the currency? baby boomers have a very unique problem. Because of the advancement in science, healthcare, and all of these things, nobody knows how long they're going to live for. 
And the probability is they're going to live longer than they think. And that means, do you have enough savings to retire on? Right? That's the only question for baby boomers. So, okay, if you want to insure against the risk of your longevity, which is obviously the thing you want to celebrate, then if you were to allocate 5% of your portfolio to cryptocurrency, just 5%, so let's say Raoul is an idiot and it all falls 50%. You lose 2.5% of your net worth. You don't even notice it. If I'm right and it goes up 20x from here, 50x from here, you've doubled your net worth. So that allows you to live another 20 years. This mm. is why it matters to baby boomers. Mm. It is the greatest policy against not having enough retirement savings because you're going to live longer. Mm. But as you said earlier in the show, Raul, we, it is going to rise and it is going to drop again. And it is going to rise and it is going to go drop again. So maybe there needs to be a psychological approach that you've got to be aware of this. It's, it's a little bit crazy town, but it's, it's a new norm. So when you talk about rise and fall, people are going to think we're talking about oil prices that do this. No, no, no. What we're talking about is a rise and fall in an exponential trend. So even though it's fallen 70%, that was on the back of a 10,000% move. And then it goes up another 5,000% and falls another 70%. What you're doing is going up in this big volatile trend. But the biggest trend of all is that the price rises are exponential. So what it means is you need to have a longer term time horizon. You don't get in this to think, I want to get rich in a year, because if you get the wrong part of the cycle and it goes down, you're going to have taken too much risk and you're going to feel terrible. If you say, you know what, if it falls, I'll add a bit more if it falls down, because we know where the trend is going. We know that all of this adoption is happening and it, we know it's volatile. So we should use the falls in price to our advantage. And once you get that mindset on the buy the dip mentality, you'll succeed. Okay, um, you've been swimming around in this currency for quite some time. So you're a bit of an expert now. I've just made you one. Listen, if I was to say, give us your top five or six uh, worthwhile watching, obviously you're going to say Bitcoin and Ethereum and all that. That's nice. But what, what's your thoughts? What would you, what gem can you give all these people watching? Yeah, on? so the gem of how to understand this space is easy. You don't need to be a genius. You just need to look at adoption. So this space is all priced in something called Metcalfe's Law. Metcalfe's Law really came about from computing, but mobile phones was the easy example. One mobile phone, worthless. Two, reasonably good if it's somebody you want to speak to. Not very useful. If you don't want to speak to them. If everybody has a mobile, you can now reach everybody on Earth. Okay, so then those same mobiles, you could put data on and have the internet on. And that changed everything. Then the computer world came along and interacted with this world. And now we've got these two networks and it's made mobile computing turn into this, a supercomputer on your phone. And what this is, is the network of money and they all follow the same thing. Metcalfe's law is the number of nodes on the network, i.e. the number of users and the amount of connectivity between the users creates the value of the network. So what you do is look at these cryptocurrencies and say, right, how many people are using it? A lot of people, is that network growing? And are people building stuff on it? If you can answer those questions with yes, then you've got a good investment. And the ones that I see that in right now um, are Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Terra, and probably Polkadot or Avalanche. And those are the ones that larger market cap. We're seeing real use cases, lots of people adopting it, and lots of people developing applications on it. So those are, those are the bets. But really, you only need to take one bet. Just take Ethereum. It's like um, Ethereum is like the internet of it's the it's like the internet of money. Mm. It's like the software platform that everything is being built on. 
And it may not go up the most, but it's going to go up a hell of a lot because it's got massive network effects. It's easy to understand. <coughs> it's easy to trade. It's easy to buy. It's liquid. And you don't have to learn too many new things. <clears throat> give, us, give us your big picture. Your big picture, 40,000 feet, looking down on the crypto world. What's your big picture to tell everybody going forward? So as I've explained, it's the fastest growing adoption of any technology in all recorded history. We're going to go from 150 million users to a billion users in three and a half years. It is going from 2 trillion to 200 trillion as an asset class, probably in 10 years. So this is the largest tailwind for any investment we've ever been given. Not only that, but it's creating an entirely new business model for the world. Everything is going to get tokenized from real estate to stock markets to bond markets to currency markets are all going to be tokenized. On top of that, people are using this to build business models, something called Web 3.0, which is where you, you give a community a system of money and say, well, look, you can all work together and build your own network. There's decentralized finance. There's non-fungible tokens, which allow you to have digital art and real art and real things of value. Somebody's just got some Aussie wine that they've auctioned as an NFT, so you get the rights to wine every year from this NFT. Uh, it's like, okay, this is interesting. So basically, everything you buy, sell, own, store, transfer is going to be digitized. And this is that world. So if you can find me anything bigger, I don't know anybody who could. This is the very system of money and value itself. And it's about to be disrupted by technology, considering that the old system of money has basically been around for a few thousand years and we're about to change it all. That's how big this is. Well, I think that everybody needs to hear you say that. <laughs> I do too. And I and passionately I believe in this. And I'm like, you can't sit and complain that the central banks are screwing you. You can't sit and complain about, I can't find an opportunity. I can't afford housing in Sydney. You can't complain about the stock markets too overvalued. When here is the opportunity, you can fractionalize it. You can buy $1 worth. You can, anybody can participate. Everyone can put 10% of their net worth in this, however rich or poor you are. So I don't want people to say, we didn't know. Those were for, for the rich guys. This is for everybody take advantage of it. Whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you live in a faraway country where you've got no opportunity, where you or you live in central Manhattan, this is for everybody. We're going to be posting this on, on our YouTube channel. And I say to everybody out there, your friends, your relatives, have them listen to what Roll just said. Everybody needs to hear this. Because I'm, I'm, I can imagine he hasn't got everything right because that's what happens in life, but I'm sure most of it's right and we must hear it. There's a big change coming. Now, Raul, you're a hedge man, so you're passionate about the uh, Dow Jones and you're passionate about property and you're passionate about all those sort of things. Um, you know, we've been told by experts for the last eight years, the share market had to crash, it had to go. Um, uh, Jeremy Grantham and Harry Dent have been preaching this for so long. Uh, they now all both look like Santa Claus. I mean, what's going on? I mean, of course, Harry and Jeremy are correct, but because the economic, the economic, the economic clock has fallen apart. What's what going on? Was the debasement of currency makes it look like the markets are going up. If you divide the Aussie stock market by the, um, by the uh, Royal Bank of Australia's balance sheet, you'll find that it hasn't gone up a lot. Mm. What you've got is poorer because every dollar of earnings you get today buys you less stocks. So your expected future wealth is less. What is mm. an asset? An asset is your ability to buy something now to store your wealth, to be able to consume later. That's all it is, right? So why do you buy second property so you've got you can cash in later for a higher price and it will have protected your savings and grown them well the problem is is if your wages don't go up and the stock market goes up 
each year you earn the same salary, you can buy less of this stuff. So your future self is poorer every year. And it's because of the value of fiat currency being debased. So this is what makes equity markets look like they're always going up. Unless they're going up at 15% a year, you ain't even breaking even. No, because you're saying it's like an artificial bubble. Correct. It's not a bubble. The bubble is in the collapse of fiat currency, not the stock market. So if you look at the stock market versus the real estate market versus gold, they're all pretty much in line. So it's not that they everything is a bubble. No, they've made it look like a bubble because the currency is being debased. I know it's a weird concept to get your head around, but it is really, really important. And if people are interested, I did a whole piece on this that is one of the most viewed pieces I ever did, maybe two and a half million views um, on YouTube on, and on Real Vision where I first did it, called The Exponential Age. And it explains this and shows you all the charts so the penny can drop because this is something you really, everybody must understand is what this is about and how your future self is getting poorer because of this very phenomena. Well, I think the World's Economics Association, which is a group of um, about 10 people, they've just banned you, I think, uh, because uh, you have uh, completely fallen out here and uh, you're in big trouble, son. Roel, it's been an absolute pleasure. Our time is up. I really love talking to you. You're very thoughtful. You're very knowledgeable. And everybody, and I say once again, everybody should have a listen to your advice on where the world's going in the next 10 years. So make sure you link it to your friends. Roel, thank you so much for being with us. It's been fantastic. Any last words you would like to say to everybody? Um, just do it. You know, don't wait for the price to fall. Don't just buy some and understand, as I said, understand it's volatile. Understand you'll feel sick when it goes down a lot, but then dollar cost average, just buy a bit more. Don't leverage. Don't use leverage. Please don't use leverage. Just think of it as this long-term opportunity, the likes of which you've never been given and just smile to yourself and say, thank you. Fantastic. Well, Thank you for being with us. I hope we can do it again. I look forward to it, my friend. Okay, bye for now. Take care.